Okay, welcome everyone uh, to this 15th uh, edition of the African Science Frontiers Initiative Seminar Series. We will be starting in two minutes. Okay. Hello, welcome everyone to the 15th edition of African Science Frontier Series. The presentation is showing. Not yet, Emma. This seminar series is entitled African Women in Science Success Blueprints. This is an important topic for African development because um, women are important corner of uh, the success of the community and all uh, the country. Uh, our uh, speaker today is uh, Prof. Uh, Babalula. She is the Director of Food Security and Safety Niche at uh, Northwest University, South Africa, and is the Vice President Organization for Women in Science for Developing Quadrant, the African Vision. Uh, African Science Frontiers Initiative is a dream that turned into reality. Uh, we started uh, nearly one and a half years ago. Our vision is to raise the next generation of African scientists with right competence to drive African developmental and transformational agenda through innovative science, uh, scientific research. The mission is to instill excellence in African science through competence acquisition, capacity building, and career development, through which African scientists can play more active role in the continent's development. Uh, we, uh, to achieve this uh, mission and vision, uh, we have several activities, uh, some of them the African Science Seminar Series, uh, which occurs uh, every three weeks. Uh, we started the uh, uh, 14th edition before, uh, and we, uh, our speakers are um, sons and daughters from different scientific and uh, social fields in Africa, from non-governmental organizations, from private people, and from all fields of science. Uh, we have also different courses and workshops to, uh, for capacity building. 
uh, we have uh, ASPI mentoring program. Uh, this uh, is um, in, uh, interested to um, instill the capacities and the skills which have learned in the courses uh, and to um, more um, develop them more and then make uh, participants able to achieve what they have learned and turn it into, into a, a successful project. Uh, we have uh, several projects which we will uh, publish in the next year. Uh, Frontier Science Seminar Series uh, 2021 is directed to, in, to disrupting stagnation and empowering African culture. Uh, this year is a seminar series directed to, uh, for capacity building. Uh, the convener, uh, Prof. Bright Nawaru, and uh, me uh, as a co convener. Um, today's seminar series African Women in Science, Success Blueprints, and uh, with um, uh, our speaker and moderator, you will know how they achieve success and uh, what we are willing to do uh, in the future. Um, some of uh, the future speakers, we have uh, Prof. Alina. Um, and the Prof. Fali. The housekeeping of uh, the seminar, um, the time is every three weeks, uh, 5 p.m. Greenwich time. Uh, we have separate registration for each seminar session, and uh, everyone is muted at entry. Uh, we have promised two hours, and we'll, uh, we will respect time. Uh, if anyone wants to speak or ask questions, uh, you can write them in the chat box and we will collect questions and uh, deliver them to the speaker and the moderator and uh, try to answer all questions. If anyone wants to speak, you can raise hands. Uh, we have also separate evaluation for each session and uh, we uh, kindly ask you all to uh, participate with your opinion to improve the seminar series. Uh, today's moderator is uh, Dr. Amanda Udi. Dr. Amanda is a feminist, gender expert, development practitioner, social justice advocate, and an academic. She currently works at the research fellow at the Center for Gender Research and Advocacy and Documentation, University of Cape West, uh, Cape Coast. She was a gender equality and social inclusion consultant for Australia Hours Africa from uh, 2015 to 2020, uh, 2016 to 2020. She was also uh, the MGF West Africa gender consultant for Ghana Netherlands projects um, uh, in 2013. Amanda holds a BA in economics and sociology. Uh, she is a major uh, gender-based violence and a PhD in development studies with a specialization in uh, masculinity. She is a co-host of reflection, show aim at discussing and drawing attention to uh, pressing issues in Ghana. Uh, she is also the Australia Awards Alumni Ambassador for Ghana. Uh, her research and her research interest and work. Uh, for the past eight years, she was engaged in research, advocacy, training, and teaching activities on women's and gender issues for university community and external bodies that seek services of the GE, GRA. Uh, her research interests are in areas of masculinities, gender-based violence, sexualities, Adolescents' reproductive health, body image, issues, and equal opportunity practices in the workplace. Amanda is currently working in on profiling masculinity through the lenses of shift and continuities of caring in Iranian masculinities post colonialism and issues of sexuality migration. Um, Amanda will introduce uh, the speaker, uh, and she has um, a great uh, profile for uh, African women. Uh, and we hope we will um, all uh, benefit uh, from uh, this interesting discussion, which will go with uh, the speaker. 
Okay. Thank you very much, Iman, for the mm -hmm. introduction. And I'd like to say a good evening, um, good morning, good afternoon, for wherever we are coming from and welcome to today. Holds extensive experience in the sciences, the subject she's coming to address today. Um, she is um, she's in the person of Professor, I, I, I hope I don't get the name wrong, Olubukola Babalola. Uh, Professor Babalola um, who is a product of the Premier University of Nigeria and Northwest University uh, of South Africa Business School. She holds a PhD in microbiology and she became a full professor in 2016 but uh, did her inaugural lecture in 2018. Professor Babalula is an NRF rated scientist. She is the vice president of the Organization of Women in Science for the Developing World, Africa region. She is the director for food security and safety niche area at uh, NWU. And she's a fellow of the World Academy of Sciences as well, um, and also, um, a science diplomat for TWAS. Professor Babalula has two postdoctoral experiences to her credit. One from Wesman East Israel. The second one, School of University, the University of Western Cape in South Africa. Sorry. Prof. Babalula has over 20 years of experience of research science in soil plant microbes interaction, focusing on rhizosphere metagonomics. Her research support uh, has come from National Research Foundation and also through the university that she has worked with. Prof. has set up a, from scratch the Microbial Biotechnology Research Laboratory at the University of um, Northwest, uh, Northwest University in South Africa. This laboratory is what brought her to the limelight for selection to be the research director for the food security and safety. She's the leading, she's currently leading uh, as the head principal investigator of the Microbial Biotechnology Research Laboratory, which is her mini United Nations with students from within and outside the African continent, and uh, where she's making substantial contribution to sciences. She's on the editorial boards of BMC. Microbiology, Elsevier, and also micro, uh, Biochemistry and Biophysics Reports, Elsevier. Our speaker has won many awards, including being the finalist for Gender Insight 2020. She has also graduated 22 doctorate fellows, 20 master students, and a number of honor students since joining the NWU in 2009. Professor Babalola has almost 200 she holds 56 certificates in her professional interest in from the University of California in the USA, University of Mauritius, University, Northwest University in South Africa, and Bradford University in the UK. This is just to mention a few, there are a number of other places. Some of the, other, in addition to the successes she has made, her efforts for SDG to zero hunger in the continent of Africa for food security and sustainable agriculture is also helping farmers women and food and food lovers all over. Prof is currently using the gender lens that she has to forge collaborations with diplomats and impacting the world of sciences, policymaking, diplomacy, and diplomatic management. Dear participants, this is our speaker for today. Her CV and her profile shows how well equipped she is to introduce us to ways of navigating the sciences as women. I would be glad if we can put down all our questions as she speaks. And when she is done, we can ask our questions. Prof, thank you for accepting the invitation and we open the floor for your presentation. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Amanda. Thank you, Dr. Um, Professor Nwaru and um, Professor Sob, I really appreciate. And also to Professor Ohio, it's a pleasure being here. Thank you for inviting me. I will now share my screen.
Yeah, thank you. Uh, today, the text before me is to speak on African women in science, so says blueprints. I see this topic as very broad. Uh, Professor Waru told me it's going to be a book chapter, but I see it as a book on its own, but I will try my best. I'm Olubukola Oluranti Babalola, and uh, I must say that the presentation today is not my world alone. Why? Because the topic given me is to speak about African women. And I really try from um, across Africa. So I co-opted and I have with me in the uh, right of um, Dr. Aguidato of, from Benin, uh, Dr. Amushenge from uh, Namibia, Professor um, Babalola, uh, Nigeria. This is another Babalola, by the way, not my own. And uh, also from Nigeria, Dr. Alaribe. From Tanzania, we have Dr. Bigambo. And Uganda, uh, Dr. Iandoi. Uh, these also are members of the Organization for Women in Science for the Developing World. And uh, placed on the screen is the logo for their different nations. The presentation outline will run through the number one to number 20, number 12 listed. But allow me to have my number one as what is O's, because O's, some people say OWSD is what I stand for. Uh, O's is the Organization for Women in Science for the Developing World. And I want to share briefly the opportunities, the relevance, and the leadership and visibility that it enhances its members. Uh, OZ uh, is the very first international organization that bears the burden of women. You will find it in developed and developing country. And our endeavor is to put forward science, not only science, science in terms of scientific technology and leadership. That's what we speak about. It's been inaugurated since 1987, and the organization provides training, networking opportunity, just like uh, what uh, Professor Maru and Sob are doing. The organization is a program unit of UNESCO. And aside from that, the opportunities that there are involves the membership. Once you are a member, you'll be uh, opportune to hear directly from the organization. It offers fellowship, workshops, award, and even beyond our funders, uh, ID Harusi and the uh, CEDA. And uh, a nation that does not have O's may start O's uh, once you have 20 members. And I encourage such individual from such nation to please contact me. Even if it is out of Africa, you will be connected. Uh, those are some of the beautiful logos from across the world. There we have that of Botswana, Cameroon, Ghana, uh, Mauritius, Namibia, Nigeria, Rwanda, South Africa, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, and much more. To be a member, it could be of any of the three categories listed. A full member is that person that has an MSc and, uh, or higher. You may be an affiliate member, but adventure you hold uh, only the bachelors. And if you're a man, you don't have to say there is nothing for me there. You can be host friend. Uh, we have you on board as for mentoring, for fundraising, for networking, and much more. That's the link. Uh, should anyone uh, be interested in joining OZ, the online application form is very user friendly. And there is also a help email that you may reach out to. The membership pamphlet is as well available online. Being an international organization, everything that you need, you get there online. Uh, these are examples of those that have benefited from OZ. I myself, I studied under the fellowship of OZ and it has been a beautiful experience since then. The fellowship offers a monthly allowance. 
It offers return tickets. Uh, it makes provision for visa and uh, medical insurance, regional science communication workshop, and much more. The eligible field is broad, and there is there is going to be probability that everyone will fit into the eligible field. We have the early career funding. Uh, you may still have had my PhD, yeah, but the early career funding caters for uh, young um, graduates and it provides 50,000 US dollars over two years. The uh, link that I have put there may be contacted for more info information. And for the early career fellowship, it covers equipment, consumable research visits, uh, teaching assistance, and much more. Uh, these are examples of the workshop that we have been carrying out. But since the advent of COVID, we've been having uh, a lot and even far more workshops online. Uh, you will agree with me that host gives visibility. Uh, in the middle picture is someone who, after receiving the Elsevier Award through host, was welcomed back to our country by the country president. That is not the only person that that has happened to. We have many examples. And uh, I, if you will observe the organogram of holes that I presented before, the, we have a president. The president is in the person of Professor Jennifer Thompson, a South African. And uh, Professor Thompson also has been, I mean, flooded with a lot of awards. We also are proud of uh, Professor Grace Alele Williams. Professor Grace Alele Williams happened to be the VP uh, Vice President of OZ in 1999 to 2002. And this is a eminent woman in her own capacity. So time will not allow me to show us more of our OZ fellows that have been doing us proud all over. Here we have the one from Uganda. And there also is uh, Dr. Uduak uh, from the Gambia. Uh, looking at our question, how is she fearing? How is uh, the woman scientist fearing in the science arena? Uh, we had a discussion and we look at it all around. Then we were able to say, not poorly compared to our counterparts in other continents. And uh, because the issue of women is not only about Africa, um, it applies to all. We also note of interest that her scientific space knows no gender difference. So whether you are a man or a woman, the scientific space does not have a gender difference. And all areas in science space are being patronized by women even astronauts or marine, uh, marine uh, name it, whatever. So uh, I have daunting numbers of uh, examples of successful African women, uh, but allow me to only present that in the book chapter because um, it's broad and it may take up all the time for the day. What are their experiences in an attempt to succeed? It has been a bittersweet experience. Bittersweet because sometimes you ride on that platform that you are a woman and it is to your benefit. And another time it's bitter experience. You wouldn't like it. So it has been a bittersweet experience. And also, uh, we gather that uh, some to them is like the people they are working with feel that they are domineering, that they want to have their way or that they are bossy. And uh, you may want to explain that out because when people begin to look at you, that you are a lady and they want to underestimate you, 
you there is the tendency to want to come up with a strategy to survive in their midst. So you will find some with a saying, you are bossy or you are overbearing. And another uh, thing that we have come to note is the area that it will be said, well done, good job, and not more than that. Whereas for the counterparts, the male counterparts, they are much more recognized. So that experience is what uh, some women are having. Their experiences also with the area of trust, issue of, uh, issue of trust, because I can give a typical example. I flew in 2018 from Durban to Johannesburg. On that beautiful day, it's a female pilot. And two men with me on checking in said, oh, we have to be careful today. <laughs> it's going to be a female pilot. You know what that means? It's like underestimation. They were actually underestimating the pilots because the pilot happens to be a woman. But that shouldn't be. That shouldn't be. They in prison, mental prison, psychological prison, as a woman is also observed by some women. Please mind you, the voice that I'm speaking with today is the voice of African women. So I'm speaking for many and uh, we collated our points before um, just representing. And also the attitude, the patriarchy attitude that people bring from home and bring it to the office. So meeting a woman in the office, you always think that that woman is like from your home. I don't know. When in the office, you are colleague and each person deserves respect, irrespective of the gender. So you'll see that aspect there. And uh, aspect of bullying and rejection is, is obvious. So we may ask that, uh, uh, other things that I want to talk about is the research building capacity. The research building, uh, the technological assistance the fellowship, the scholarship, and the postgraduate training. See, I've learned so many things up here, but I'll be glad during the question time if specific questions could be raised on the things that I have uh, listed. Uh, so I want, I'm trying to open another screen because my screen is blocked here. Yeah, so... Uh, what opportunities have they had? The opportunity is like the techn technological assistance that is given, the specific award that we specify that these awards are for women. Then some institutions, they have caught the gender vision. Some institutions are actually using gender links. So you will see such institutions that they have money that protects the women, that have uh, make provision for women in what they are doing. Also, there are uh, research grants and, um, and travel grants, a few that caters for you to even travel with your, your child, probably the, the suckling child, so that the woman does not miss out on the opportunity of internationalizing our research or being in the international forum. We have uh, um, exposure also in terms of academic and professional in internship that is made available specifically for women. And still on the opportunities that uh, are available, uh, aspects of attention nowadays that is being given to early and mid-career scientists. Sometimes past, it wasn't like that. And um, the emergence of gender movements, 
gender movement and issue about uh, affirmative action that now make provision to 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 help the um the the female also we have aspect of um you know when uh you are in a difficult situation you tend to grow thick skin you tend to have a, a coping mechanism so we have seen also the positive side of adversity that is catapulting uh, women scientists to success because it's like you have been made, you, you have to be toughened to, to fit the situation that you have found yourself. Capacity building opportunities also exist from external sources for African uh, women scientists and uh, also issue about this emerging development paradigm where globalization and modernization and those issues are bringing enlightenment to those that are still deep and backward and they are getting to realize that the uh, woman for also needs to be liberated the opportunities that are uh, also include issues of national academy of science i will give an example i know of a nation where in the National Academies of Science, there is a deliberate attempt. I mean, it, it, it's a planned attempt to see that the percentage of women in the Academy of Science uh, is something to show off about. And that nation meant business. And they have, I mean, is actually doing it. So uh, opportunities like that exist. And we have uh, seed grants, uh, institutional funding, and the uh, issue of um, online presence that is open to anyone, be it male or female, you only need to make your voice to be heard. The opportunity that we have also uh, I can trace it to the issue of sustainable development goal, because in it, the number five is about gender and equality. So you can uh, see that even there is an attempt, I mean, there is recognition for gender, even in the sustainable development goals, and it's open to all. I will say that there are talents in Africa because I could reflect, uh, I reflected deeply sometimes back, uh, dating back to 2016. And I wrote a quote that there are talents in Africa as shown on the screen. One of the um, quotes is after many days of deep thought, and I, I see that these women are, they are resilient. They are, they are powerful. They are cream of the society. No matter what, they, you see them bouncing back after every, every attempt to push them under. Anyway, uh, the journey, uh, what, what challenges um, the woman is facing, the woman scientist. We will break that into three, the personal challenges and the environmental one. And for the personal challenges, it is obvious the additional role that the woman occupies, the role of a wife. You wonder how has that got to do with her career? Because she's still the same woman. Yeah, and the role of a mother. And she will serve the role of the sister and daughter-in-law. Uh, you can, even that of the daughter-in-law sometimes, especially if the in-laws are living with, with this nuclear family, is a daunting task for the woman. Often she's left with inadequate time to do groundbreaking research because the little time that there are, she has a life to manage, 
She has the husband to care for. She has the children to manage. So many things. And yes, she's a career woman. You'll find in some African countries that even the woman, this woman scientist is the breadwinner. And despite still being the breadwinner, the domestic chores are still her. They are part of her package. So you see, it's not an easy one. And all these are the challenges personally that she experiences. The early career woman, if I will use that one, mostly with the young lady. And we have a young family, we have children. And this same woman will want to attend conferences. If it is the male counterpart that want to attend conference, it is not an issue about how do I manage the children? Or even if it is one child, how do I manage the child as I leave for my conference? But in the case of the woman, that is another extra luggage to manage. So institutional challenges are there as well. I mean, the recognition of the relevance of her research work. Sometimes she needs to perform well above others she will really need to flex her moz before someone notices that she's in existence. The unequal pay pack is also obvious as part of institutional challenges that a woman faces. In some countries, they use a parallel payment, whereby if you are on level one, and the same amount for level one. People from such African countries, may not understand what I'm saying by unequal pay pack. But certain countries there are also in Africa, they don't use this um, equal, I mean, flat, or how would I say it, um, pay pack. And you will see the disparity for the same amount of job that a woman is doing and same that a man is doing, but the woman will be underpaid, gross underpayments. There are environmental challenges as well. We are aware most African countries, uh, issue of patriarchy. Um, and this is a big issue, a really big issue because uh, you want to maintain your career, you want to maintain your home, you want to maintain your life. So you find out that the woman is subjected to all these and uh, a number of women bear, bear these uh, burden because they want to manage the home. They just want to. So women are pushing. They are really pushing and I mean, um, str struggling to sustain everything. And uh, she has a limited or increasing opportunity and resources also to sustain her research. So though it is increasing, but it's still limited. And the uh, issue about the physical environment that often limits our ability is so obvious. So you find her struggling to retain her place in science arena. A number may want to pull out and go, uh, go for jobs that um, does not really involve core, core research because you want to see how will I cope it's just in me to manage everything. And uh, especially if and that individual does not have a, a, a good supporting partner, it tells on her a lot. So uh, limited resources in terms of time as well, and the cultural obligations that is placed um, before her, all these cells as constraints. Uh, lack of financial means to ensure education of girl child to the university level by some parents. It's not everyone that can afford to send the girl child to the university because some have already have the mentality that um, she will marry. And once she marries out, uh, she doesn't bear my name. She bears the name of the husband. So what is there for me? So that's another challenge. And uh, uh, it will take a strong determination to get that uh, challenge removed. 
uh, the lack of recognition in workplace and the society has made it like that. Uh, so you find it even in homes, uh, the way we raise the girl child and the, the, the boy child, you will see we are uh, putting some differences which ought not to be. And I use this uh, opportunity to speak to those on this uh, platform that even the way we raise our children at home, we should not be inculcating this patriarchy thing in them. Uh, the weight of marriage and motherhood in progression for women in science is another issue because uh, to do PhD, you need certain number of years and then the pressure is there uh, to raise kids. And uh, so it's really, we take someone to be of strong will and to have support structure to overcome this challenge. Uh, discouraging remarks, some environments don't even encourage female scientific leadership and then some home, workplace and school do not encourage it. And may I say again that um, all the listed points are the from the conversation we had uh, as members in the uh, chapter that we are writing. And these are just the summary from the work. We then want to see what are their success blueprints. Hmm, interesting. Uh, there are so many and they are diverse. Uh, I want to mention uh, first joining professional association. Why am I saying that? It's a platform for networking. It's a platform for collaboration. It's a platform also to socialize and to ease off um, because you actually need people of like mind with you at a certain level in your career. Otherwise, you either bend low, but if you really want to sustain the temple, you need people of like mind. And um, I will also say part of the success blueprint is to attend industry events. I'm saying industry because when we talk of science, it's not only about academics like uh, teaching and research that we do in the university. We also talk about industry, industry events. Success blueprint for a woman in science will reflect cutting edge research because that is, can be a leverage to take her out of the dungeon of, um, uh, of a novice and aspect of resource mobilization. Nothing can be done if there is no fund. In fact, it is said that money makes the world to go around. So resource mobilization is paramount to success in, uh, in research. Uh, collaboration cannot be overemphasized because these days you have to internationalize your research. Otherwise it is will be you yourself and I, and that will take you nowhere. Uh, you will want to also stay relevant in the field. And to stay relevant in the field, you need to be dynamic, to move with a trend. Uh, let me give an example. When I started, I will do the plant microbe interaction in the basic. But with time, uh, I see the developments that people are now talking about metagenomics. People are talking about next generation sequencing. People are talking about metatranspiratory. They are seeing uh, nanotech. People are saying things that if you will remain in the previous, uh, with time, you will be out of job. So you will see, you need to stay relevant in the field. That is part of the success blueprints. And to attend thematic conferences, not just any conference, because you want to go to conferences that matters, where the reviewers and the author of your of uh, of research in your field of interest will be attending. And uh, success blueprint has also to do with 
capacity building, building others, because you want to hand over the baton to the upcoming generation. And a key thing in success blueprint is to be self-driven. In fact, you need that to, to be successful in science. And success blueprint has to do with the generation of products. Uh, I'm relating also to industry now. It has to do with publishing for those in the university. And it has to be with playing the role of the mentor and the mentee. Sometimes you can fit in as the mentor and at the same time, the mentee of another person. And the strong will to be uh, must be there because for success, she needs to be a go-getter. The woman scientists need to be resilient, in fact, technology savvy, and to be highly emotionally intelligent. Yeah, there is no shortcut about that. You want to have also the academic digital footprint that um, will be there for the world to see. Because nowadays, anything we do anywhere is obvious. As we are speaking now, if we put it live on YouTube, it's, it's everywhere in the world we see. So you want to have the academic digital footprint that um, uh, it commands respect, and that is part of the success blueprint. So still on, um, on, on that, uh, there's need to focus. There's need to focus focus on service to humanity. Because any research that is done that has no relevance to humanity is no research. It will end up on the bench. It will just be there in the library bookshelf. But when it has relevance to humanity, then uh, it's bound to impact life. And you want to reward yourself because as a woman in science, if you are not recognized, you are not celebrated, you are not rewarded. You have to learn to reward yourself. If you reward, if you have gotten used to rewarding yourself, you won't wait for any uh, person's recognition. And uh, should they now recognize you, so be it. The drive must be high with a positive energy and even the attitude, because we know the attitude will determine the altitude. And uh, it's important to also be uh, exercising, to do self-improvement and to do stress management. Uh, you don't want to break down and you want to still be relevant. So you will need self-improvement. I remember when I started my own uh, PCR, we will need to be doing some things a little manual, but you see the machines that uh, students are using now is far ahead of the machines that we use. And I could remember pipetting also when you will be doing, and, and now you just do the thing like this. And so you see, uh, uh, there is need for self-improvement. The technology is not stagnating and then you just need to move with technology. Uh, the strategy for success, they are numerous. And I must also say that there is no one size fits all because even the one that we say now, if it works now, another time it may not work. You actually need to know the situation, the surrounding or the prevailing situation will influence what strategy to, um, to use. You may have to delegate. You may uh, also think of uh, having a, a mentor or someone as a role model that you are looking up to. 
uh, it's important to learn to prioritize activities. And the body that is doing the work, also you need to listen to the body. You don't want it to break down because this same you is the mother, is the research scientist, is the wife, is the daughter in law. You are just everything. And the aspect of collaborating with people of like minds, I've said it earlier, it applies also under strategies um, for success. And um, if one is well funded, you may have a research assistant because it's going to make life easier. The aspect of staying focused is very important. Um, by that, I mean uh, not to be jack of all trade, because if you are publishing and the same you publish on ice cream, the same you publishes on malaria and uh, agriculture, all of them, they bear no relevance. So that becomes suspicious. It's important to stay focused um, and then um, pick an area of research because that's an important strategy for success. Uh, possessing skills and know-how is, is nowadays is even easier to achieve because there are many online, online assets that you can even teach yourself online. You just need that determination. And then navigating of uh, unfriendly terrain, that will need emotional intelligence to do that. And then not letting go of opportunity and seeking excellence in research. That push can help in giving a leverage because you are seeking excellence. And that can even be a motivating factor to, to visiting labs, to, to having collaborator and things like that for your research. So when we talk about um, uh, women in science, we want to see, uh, I will advise that there should be passion about your career. Are you an upcoming scientist? You should have passion. Passion, it will keep you going. Because sometimes in the lab, the results are not forthcoming. It can be devastating and frustrating. But when you have passion for what you are doing, that can keep you going. The aspect of resilience, we keep coming in this presentation because be it as an early career or mid career or advanced scientist, we need that resilient spirit. How do you feel when a paper is rejected? You just have to bounce back to life and fire on. And then um, you need to be detail oriented. And at that same time, be, uh, be visionary. You, I will encourage you to make use of any opportunity, every opportunity that comes your way. They are not always there, but when you see them, grab them with both hands. And it's um, crucial to be determined in what you are doing, probably even to set goals for yourself. And the area that you have chosen, your area of research, strive to be an expert in that area because that's what you want to become an authority in. It, you also need to learn to be a team player because in science, we we'll always talk about collaboration. You, if you want to do it alone, you move fast, but you cannot go further. So you really need the aspect of um, working in team. You must be self-motivated woman because uh, I don't think there is anyone that will motivate you because you will be the one motivating the children. You will be the one motivating uh, those that you have put in your lab. So you have to uh, be a motivator yourself. You have to motivate yourself. And it's uh, 
necessary to be an effective communicator. You know the number of hours you are spent in the laboratory? I mean, mixing chemicals, doing these, analyzing the graph, the data, and how will the world see what you are doing if you cannot communicate? So you will need to be an effective communicator. Uh, we also advise the early career scientists to be have this creative thinking uh, uh, attitude because it's going to help you to eat the jackpot. Uh, otherwise, you can't keep doing the same thing every time and be expecting a different result. So there will be need for critical thinking to help scientists. Uh, you know, the aspect of self-care, aspect of rejuvenation, because uh, as senior scientists, the age is setting in and uh, there is need for self-care. Also, there is need for you as a stakeholder in science to take up the role of a mentor. That's why sometimes in a uh, hose, when a few we ask can say, but I don't need a PhD fellowship. I don't need uh, this and that. So what is there for me to gain? Then the answer is, is because you are only looking at yourself. Should you look at how to impact life, then you see you will be good at being the mentor. So you will take up that role as a stakeholder in science and be the mentor. You will build the uh, student, I mean, the mentor mentee relationship. You will build it because you, at that time, don't even sometimes not really student supervisor relationship because at student supervisor relationship, the supervisor's own is to say, well done, good job. But at a mentor mentee relationship, the mentor role is to bring out that great scientist in you. So you want to build that great scientist whom we can hand over the baton onto, and also to continue to strive to the highest mark. I will say, take a girl child to work. Why? Because if uh, I will give example of my, my, my girl child, and at that age in the primary school, they brought a um, musician to the school, you know, the musician wearing nice shining outfit and singing. The musician was on the stage and people were clapping. Then the guy got home and said, I want to be a musician. Say why? Say in school today, they brought somebody and I want to be like her. So the next uh, opportunity, they brought a nurse and they demonstrated how the nurse assisted when there was emergency and an accident emergency and how the nurse saved life. So she came home again, she changes, no more to be a musician, but now she wants to be a nurse. Why? Because she sees that the nurse could save the life of somebody. You see, things like that, when we take a girl child to work, they see corporate lifestyle. They see that this same me that is at home cooking, I mean, doing dishes, doing laundry and everything, I can still be corporate. Then the girl child, we have the notion that, oh, I will also study because I aspire to also, so I will say to the senior scientists, take a girl child to work. Uh, the quote from Brian says, when kids look up to great scientists, the way they do to musicians, actors, and sport figures, civilization will jump to the next level. 
so we see the work of um, scientists is all around um, the clock. Then how has, um, how did she do it to reach the top? Building successful STEM career is exactly what this question is all about because uh, we looked at it and said, this is about building a successful STEM career. A woman will have to capitalize on diverse coping strategies. They are diverse, they are broad, because the situation you find yourself will determine the coping mechanism to adopt for that situation. In any case, I will say don't overcommit and remain curious because you need to be conversant with the technology. Then the initiative has to be strong that I want to be on top. That initiative has to be there. Also to learn to enjoy what you are doing because when you, you like what you are doing, you will put your everything in it. Uh, one may be lucky to have a good support structure. Support structure could be in terms of partner, it could be in terms of parents, it could be in terms of siblings. And then if one has that hope, um, in place, that's a good one. Uh, to reach the top, taking risk, calculated risk is a must. Uh, another way that it's been done is to have a one safe of all these myriad online lectures. Some are paid for, but there are a lot there, out there, that you don't need to pay a dime. So um, aspects of research integrity, scientific writing, public speaking, time management, delegating, there are online courses on these ones freely available. The, you only need to make sure once you start them, you complete, because that's another thing with online um, courses. And be prepared to accept constructive criticism because without that, uh, one way is stagnant. Another way of do, doing it is to have skills. The skills are many. Analytical skills, research skills, Name it as I've listed on the screen. Look, now is the digital age. And if you are not literate in that aspect, then you are indirectly not going to be the best that you can be. So all these skills are relevant to a woman in science. How did she do it? Is about having clear vision. When you have a vision, you pursue the vision. But when you are aimless and you have no goal, that's a stumbling block. So a woman scientist and her career goal is one thing. Her skill, her knowledge, her attitude are also part of the package. And having career mentors, Building professional network, we mentioned the issue of collaborating as well, and reading and studying about everything in line that I mean, things that are highlight to what she is doing will give her an edge. Then the question is. What's the biggest up and, uh, and down barrier that probably we have been experiencing or have experienced? And then uh, we actually ruminate and we say, no, we have the same problem. The, the problem is, is there, is the same, is the same. The only difference is maybe the level at which one person experiences it may not be as deep as the other person experiences it. Uh, for example, 
if one marries into a family that has a very low esteem, they don't even value you to say, oh, you are an optometrist and you, are, you were conducting uh, eye surgery, so you couldn't come home on time and things like that. They don't understand such. But if one is uh, fortunate to, to, to be among those that have high self-esteem, uh, they will cherish you. They know that instances like that will come and um, when patients are in difficult situation, that keeps you staying back to attend to such um, situation. And um, this one, I want to give a um, personal example that how have I been dealing with them? Um, it's about creativity, thinking out of the boss. Is, um, it's about the determination to do cutting edge research. Even if you don't have all the equipment, you don't, you don't, you, you, you may not even know it very well, but you read it in journal article and you want to do it. That is why there's an, um, it's good to collaborate and to network, to visit laboratories. And then uh, another thing that I've uh, seen that helped me is the aspect of postdoctoral exposure. I had two, uh, one in Israel and the other one in Cape Town. And um, such exposure is, is, is great because uh, you, 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 your, your mind is open. In fact, those two occasions, in my own case, I wasn't teaching. So is research Monday to Friday, and you can see the, the products. Uh, dealing with all these um, that we've mentioned also has to do with learning to be productive. If you are in, working in the university setup, you want to publish, because you will still have to retain your competitiveness. And then you have to be thinking deep to generate ideas, innovative idea. I put gender as part of the way to deal with them. You may wonder why. Gender because even that same thing that seemed to be obstacle could still be the food stool because there are instances that I will ride on that, that I'm a black female. So it gives me an edge. And um, also when you do work that is contributing to the SDG, it's great because that's the end team now. And then uh, empowerment, empowerment, empowerment. You just have to, to remain uh, relevant and then, uh, Another thing is to deal with all the audios is to be prepared for the unexpected. Prepare for the unexpected. Uh, in my suggestion as the way forward is to learn to balance work-life um, integration because you are the woman, you are the wife, you are the mother, you are the daughter-in-law, you are the career woman. Your mental health is uh, must be sound. I mean, nothing must go wrong there. So you must manage expectations and don't overcommit. Uh, try to go the way of a digital transformation is the hinting and uh, engage in a sub-regional cooperation. You cannot work in isolation. We've been talking about collaboration, networking, and then ensure to have a synergy that will reduce duplication of research. That you can achieve by collaborating. And uh, I will encourage my fellow women to do research that has a national relevance because um, you don't want the work to just end there in the library with nothing happening. Also that our work must translate to policy because if we that are doing the research 
cannot make policy briefs, cannot recommend um, those to, to, to uh, do the stakeholders, then who will? And also the aspect of inclusiveness, because it's easier to point uh, a, 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 a Sorry, my battery is going down. It's easier to point accusing finger to others and be saying um, uh, the men can the male counterparts, the male counterpart. But we ourselves, we have to look inward and learn to adopt that inclusiveness, even in our research laboratory. Keep being resilient. And uh, we know this is the days of the fourth industrial revolution. The world is uh, advancing. We need to quickly cash up. And if there is need for retooling, retool. Because if that is the way out, do it. And in conclusion, because uh, mostly we, uh, as human, is the tendency is there to point accusing finger to another person. But we should know that it is the responsibility of each one of us. It is the responsibility of organizations. It is the responsibility of governments in Africa to support STEM education and um, career. I'm a product of many uh, organizations, probably by way of visitation or funding or training or exposure and they uh, have benefited from all these organizations that have um, pasted their logo here. Um, we've consulted a lot of um, papers to come out with what we have written. And then these are a few of them. The images that I've used, I've given credit to the owner of the images, they are in the public um, repository. Uh, it will soon be holiday. I'm wishing every one of us a uh, season greeting from the Organization for Women in Science from the, uh, for the Developing World. Asante Sana, Nangode, Ape, Mercy, Nkosi, Eshe, Adupe, Abora. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof, for this insightful presentation. We are grateful for what you have exposed us to. So I will summarize the presentation and then we we'll give ourselves about 25 to 30 minutes to ask questions so that Prof will answer. So some of the take homes I have highlighted is that the paucity of women in science is a global phenomenon and not just Africa. However, African women are doing quite well, so we need to acknowledge their efforts as well. We also um, have heard the, from the professor the fact that the challenges women face uh, there are multiplicity of issues. It comes from gender stereotyping, uh, patriarchal issues in the workplace and at home, uh, how their roles that they play in the home affect how they are, it, uh, they are even able to perform at work. Then gender discrimination in the workplace. So she wrapped up these into two broad areas, the personal challenges that women face, as well as the institutional challenges, such as wage, uh, wage gap, lack of support. The architecture of the workplace, which does not take into consideration sometimes these dual roles that women play as mothers, caregivers in the home, and how these potentially uh, can affect the ability to give off their best and come up with um, great um, science. Great um, however, there, there's hope from the presentation. There are so many ways that we can deal with this and how to maneuver. And key issues that she raises about being passionate, being resilient, uh, and building yourself to be able to catch up. Um, some of the things she highlighted is the fact that we do not, as female scientists, have to focus only on, on ourselves, but we need to learn to build others as we grow up so that it helps with sustainability and as well as bringing out the best you have in yourself as, as a scientist. We need to learn to reward ourselves as well. You, not, you have to learn how to take some time off and uh, when to have a self-reflection on what, where you are lacking and not always attributing it to the external forces. We also have to publish because that's why you, you remain relevant. We have to learn to collaborate both in academia and then at the industry level. We also need to undertake research that focuses on humanity because that's the only way we can make 
and impact. We need to create a niche for ourselves. We don't have to be all over the place. Find where your area is and, and research into this. Uh, we need to also, at, at the, from right from home uh, to the institutional spaces is gender resocialization. What are we saying about women, the abilities and all? So we take the girl child to school and um, teach people how to respect the roles, significant roles that women also play in the workplace. Um, she mentioned is going to be helpful. And one key thing, which is the last one I'm going to highlight is the fact that she says that they are talent in Africa. She has seen resilient, powerful young women who can bounce back or who bounce back from any attempt to push them down. So which means that there's, there are so many ways that we can come back and build ourselves. So I hope that I have been able to summarize this presentation well. And if we have any questions, um, we can put it in the chat. Professor Nwari is um, collating the questions and he'll project them on the screen for us to be able to ask and Paul to answer them. So Prof Nwari, we are ready for you. So one of the questions is that, Prof, there's age limit for many of the out. Okay, so we're starting from question one. Please, Professor Olubukola, are there seminar organization for African men? If yes, please link us up. So this is a man waiting to find out what opportunities also exist for men. Yeah, thank you. The seminars does not, um, there is inclusion, if I may say. And by the way, we just finished one in uh, Namibia and uh, a few men were in attendance. Don't forget when I was talking about the membership of O's, we have what we call the friends of O's. So if you join, uh, you are a man and you have joined, whenever they send information to members, you are going to receive it because you are also a member. So the same way then you apply to be in the meeting, we need men as well. And by the way, the way God forms it, it is never in isolation. Okay, thank you very much. Prof, next question. Okay. The next question, um, the first part compliments you for the information that you gave on the, and also your position as a vice president from OUST. But she wants to know how to navigate around toxic work environment where colleagues are very antagonistic and petty as one gets awards and recognition through hard work and diligence. Uh, thank you for the question. This question you have not asked only for yourself. Everyone will benefit. And when we talk about toxic work environments, sometimes it can even be toxic boss <laughs> because uh, the toxic work environment is broad. If you find yourself in such a place, you shouldn't allow it to debar you. It's like someone going on a journey and you have many potholes on your way. You will have to navigate and move on. Although it's painful, because the journey would have been smoother if there are no potholes. So I refer to such incidents as the potholes that one meet on the way. You have, sometimes you will navigate across, sometimes we jump over. Another thing is, if those people don't need to know about your success story, you don't need to share it with them. And then when you share it on uh, social media, because I won't say you should not share it on social media because it's part of what I say, that if no one is rewarding you, no one notices you are there and no one even uh, recognizes your effort. You've gone, you, you need to quickly shine your own light. So I would say, uh, keep on being resilient. Don't let them debar you. And at the same time, apply for more things so that you will get more award. Okay, thank you, Prof. So the next question wants the um, question wants to find out what are the general requirements for sponsorships or research funding? 
and how available are fellow females to do mentorship and supervision for upcoming female scientists and researchers. So it's in two parts. The first one is how to assess uh, sponsorship and scholarships for research funding. And then the second part wants to find out the availability of females to mentor um, younger ones. Thank you. Uh, first question about scholarship for funding. Mm -hmm. Then the other one about mentorship. For scholarship for funding, any funding that is of international, uh, to be assessed internationally, are not kept secret. They are online. If you go online, use certain keywords, say uh, PhD scholarship, you will see a lot. Just take time to do internet search, you will see. And you will find out that some have closed then you can note them because majority of them opens annually. So like funding that will be used next year, 2022, they have applied this 2021, a number of them, the results are out so that these individual can prepare to get the visa and do all the necessary uh, background work to, to go to the place of study. So those things are no more in the secret. These are the age, uh, I said, is the digital age. All these things are online. It's also good to go to um, places like British Council and things like that because they have information that you can pick, especially if you want to study in a particular, maybe if I want to study in Australia now, I can go and get information from Australian embassy and things like that. And uh, if I want to give example of South Africa, Every year they put online uh, for the National Research Foundation PhD um, scholarship, and they are giving a lot of people, even people that are not covered by who. South Africa covers them, give, give them the funding. And once you have it, I'm telling you three good years for PhD, fully funded. That's a big thing. When you talk about how to get a, a, a mentor, Okay, I assume you are at this. You are still at the stage like a, um, a, a a fresh graduate or as yeah. So if you need a mentor, you have to present yourself as someone that needs a mentor. I have, for example, mentee that I've never even we've not seen each other like this except on Zoom. So you are not limited by anything. And you know, these days, there is nothing you cannot go. Just type there, how to uh, mentor, mentee relationship, and the, those things will open your mind and give you more guidance than we can avail ourselves. There is a teaching on its own on mentor, mentee. That one is a, is a topic on its own, just like you can take collaboration as a topic on its own, research collaboration. So that's a topic on its own, but you can email me, I will guide you further. I think the person also wants to find out how available are these women, or how ready are they to, to mentor people that approach them? After you found out all this information, how available would these women be to mentor you? There is no one size fits all. You know, one of the trainings I conducted on mentor mentee relationship, when we had the question and answer section, we had a role play and we, we had what was wrong with that mentee. The mentee had no teachable spirit. You understand? So it's, it, there is no one size fits all. And it's not good to go and have a mentor that you and the mentor are, are like equal because now there will be like competition. Mm. Okay. But are there general requirements for assessing research funds and sponsorships? The general requirement is to follow the mandates of the funder, for example, if I say I'm going to fund people in chemical science and you, you are writing something on agriculture, 
you won't get the fund because it's out of scope for the funding. Or if I say this funding is for those in disadvantaged or they say least developed country, things like, so you have to follow the mandate of the funding agency. By the way, I'll give example. I, I didn't know what Striga Emotica is, but I wanted to work at IITA. And when I approached the scientist, Dr. Banner, those days, he told me he, is, he can only work on Striga Emotica on maize. So I have to yield to him. So sometimes if you want to work with uh, somebody, you have to follow the course of action of that person. Because if you, you don't have alignment, you can't work together. Hmm. Okay. Hello? Hello? Amanda, I have a comment on um, this question. Okay. Uh, for mentoring, uh, I, I want just to elaborate that um, the mentoring is uh, not um, for uh, women to women mentoring or men to men. Uh, you, you need to choose your mentor uh, depending on criteria of uh, what you need from him or her to uh, achieve or uh, uh, your, the skills you want to um, um, develop uh, from your mentor. So the uh, mentoring opportunities for either mentors or mentees are available from different organizations and uh, different uh, societies. Uh, and everyone uh, should present himself and prepare uh, his uh, requirements either as a mentor or a mentee and try to get into the track, try to uh, apply and see what is going on. Uh, not the search for um, a woman or um, men to uh, just for uh, to be um, a sense of uh, gender sympathy. Okay, we as a woman support each other, uh, but actually uh, your mentor have a certain criteria you search, should search for regardless of the gender. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Iman. Um, Alice was the one that asked the question on uh, general requirements for sponsorship for uh, research and grants. Uh, ASFI has a grant writing workshop. So next year, we're hoping that you will join. And so at, at the end of the session, you can um, contact Iman or Prof to join ASFI so that next year you can participate in the workshop and find out more ways to be able to access some of these sponsorships and grants. So the next question is women phobia over mathematical concepts in sciences. Quantitatively, how do we eradicate or address this issue among women in science? So the question was to find out how to address the issues of women maths phobia. Um, Prof. Yeah, thank you. You know, sometimes when we don't know the opportunities that are there for us, we can be scared. But I want to tell you, Mathematics is a scarce field. Those people that read mathematics, you will hardly find them jobless from my own experience because they are sought after. But we don't have many of them. So if anyone is, uh, is doing such, uh, I mean, study in that field, there is, uh, I mean, there is a wide, access for such individual in the global world. So when if we if we have that understanding, it will reduce the the phobia that we have because um, I don't think there is any other way to encourage someone than to tell the person that this mathematics, if you are able to achieve it, you will forge ahead. And you know, even uh, to do science, I mean, there are you, math, physics, chemistry, biology, and English. Those five subjects are paramount for you to be in the science class in certain nation. And I know in a, a particular country where people that shy away from science, they went to do what we call mass literacy. They find it difficult when it comes to university admission because many of the good courses that they could have done, 
once the, you did not do the proper mathematics, you are exempted from, I mean, you are disqualified from being in such a class. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next question, please. So uh, for this, <laughs> sorry, it's similar to the earlier question. So, is there any way sex factor retard the interest of women in science? So, does one gender contribute to the, the lack of interest of women in science? Uh, science has no gender. That's the simple answer. <laughs> okay. So, please, how can age barrier be addressed, especially with regards to early career fellowships? Uh, this is like what I said before, because if the funding uh, organization says, once you are 40 years old, we will not be able to fund you. It's difficult for an individual to go and change it. Except that individual look for other funding, whereby age of 40, for example, I just use 40 as an example, will not be a limiting factor because most people, when they sponsor you, they want you to still be actively using the knowledge acquired during the sponsorship. So that is why they put it like maybe age 30 and then blue and things like that. So you cannot rewrite for them because they had a funding agency. And mind you, sometimes the people that apply are even more than is needed. So they try to raise the bar. When they raise the bar, they use it to streamline their own work. Because if they, they, if they say, okay, above so, so, so age can still apply, then there will be too many applications that they can even undo. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so um, this person wants to find out, um, Okay, so Prof. Balila mentioned taking advantage of online courses and this aspect ASF I implement. So it's talking about the opportunities that are available for ASF. So this is not of a question. But then uh, as a follow up to the earlier question, um, you know, women in Africa, most women come to academia very late. So because of childbirth and these gender roles that you mentioned. Uh, so that's how come I'm, I'm, I'm actually thinking maybe this person is asking from that perspective. So she comes in late and is an early career, but is not is beyond the age that is required. Mm -hmm. just, yeah. yeah, you may not be entitled to certain uh, funding agencies and support, but that shouldn't debar you because uh, a, a number of people also did self funding and they are doing well, but we always wish we have the funding to make our lives easier. Mm. Okay, so for all of us, you can see on the screen the opportunities available at ASFI for um, learning and building your capacity online. I've been one of the beneficiaries. I've, I've, I've been part of the, all the courses and I've made gains in various aspects. So we are hoping that you follow our YouTube channels and on participate in the various courses on systematic review, grant writing, reproducibility in scientific research and the new ones that are coming up this year. And this is done every year. So if you missed out this year, next year, the opportunity is this for you to be able to take some of these courses. Next, please. Prof. Moore, is that? Oh, okay. Another comment. So this is a comment. It says, I believe sometimes the main problem is in us, we women. Yes, with all due respect to many, but sometimes at turning points, we just do not fight enough. This may be a result of the environment we grew up in or a, pers or a personal reason for excessive fear that our family will be affected by whatever is to come, even if it's something better. Uh, it's a comment and I, I appreciate the person that passed the comment. And if you look at what I put in one of the slides, I even wrote gender there and I was saying that that we suppose to be negative, that you can turn it around to, to your own advantage. So it happens. Mm. Mm. Okay. 
Next, please. Okay. It might be too long to wait to see a change in the next generation children due to education we provide as parents. How can we and where can we start to change this unwritten rule of on inequality between women and men in the gender pay, uh, pay gap, I think. Uh, no matter how long it, will, it may be, it starts now in our different homes. You see, me having children, boys and girls, making sure that I do not give uh, a particular kind of treatment to the boy and making the boy to feel that he is superior to the girl. It starts from that home, when in our different homes, giving them equal attention, making them to know that they have, uh, they all have equal access. Because when you start creating mentality in one, that uh, you are the hair and you are the man, you are the boy, and then the other one to go and wash dishes, the other one to you have already started defining so when that boy now marries he has the mentality that the wife is the one sweeping the and doing dishes and he is always the boss so and it will carry that notion to office also to the extent that when there is a office meeting it will expect probably the colleague that is a female to serve him tea. When that one is not the tea person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. I think I can, oh, I would also like to add on that uh, when it comes to gender pay gap, it can be more of an institutional solution as well. So if institutions decide that, okay, we're going to set up rules and boundaries so that women and men um, benefit equally. So you mentioned in your institutional barriers, the work environment and the structures. So I think if institutions make up their mind that they will let it work, it's something that we can sure. correct. Yeah. So Prof, there is age limit for many of our program. Also, is also is this clause of technological lagging states, countries, and is, and it prevents some to apply. So how do we address it? Thank the you. I mentioned, I mentioned that our funder, we have funders like CEDA like Heidi Harusi. So if the funding agency says, these are the countries I want to fund, if you want to include other countries that are not that country, you will go and seek for fund elsewhere. You understand what I'm saying? So you will use the fund of those who want to fund the countries that they agree to fund, then you get more funding for other countries that those ones have excluded. And that is the problem because the funds are not forthcoming. And certain countries, even my own country is excluded. So I understand what the uh, person asking the question is saying. Mm -hmm. um someone wants to know how people with disabilities are covered in these programs, how are they? When you apply for who's funding, it doesn't discriminate whether you are disabled in any way or not. What speaks for you in the panel of decision is the proposal that you have submitted. And the proposal uh, assessed and the, the number of applications are streamlined and panels are called also to seat, panel of experts are called to now look at all the proposals again before scorings are done and funding is allocated based on where the scoring stop. I mean, for example, if you say what we have is 800 million, for example, then the money is start given until it, the mark to the score where the fund is exhausted. Mm. Okay, thank you, Prof. The next question is whether a, a new person can uh, get a postdoctoral opportunity, a new person to uh, in oust. If you're a new person or a new member of oust, 
are you qualified to get a postdoctoral opportunity? By the way, postdocs are work made for hire. When you are a postdoc, you are hired for something, make your expertise. So now, if a lab is working on milk, for example, uh, they will want to hire a postdoc who is working on milk. Most times, when there is a postdoc uh, and people want postdoc, they are advertised. So you have to submit your application like every other person and your CV will speak for you. The cash now, where you are publishing, can, can help you or pull you down because you won't be there to defend yourself. And if you've been publishing in all those journals of volume one, volume two, predatory journals and all whatnots, be sure that such application is weak because each time you call for postdoc application, you need to see the number of applications that will be submitted each time. Okay. So um, I think we've addressed the question 11. So we'd like to say a big thank you to you, Prof, for your time uh, and for the insightful uh, presentation and discussions we've had. We are hoping that next time when we call on you, you'll come and help us as well. Thank you so much. So I'll hand over to Iman to continue with the next session of the program. Uh, thank, thank you, Prof. Babajula, for this um, eminent presentation. And uh, we appreciate your um, participation in the ASPI seminar series. Uh, looking forward for future collaboration. Thank you, Amanda, for um, uh, moderating this uh, session. And also, uh, you have a, a long history of um, uh, participation in uh, ASPI uh, seminar series and the courses. Uh, looking forward to see you in future uh, seminars and the courses. Um, please uh, don't forget our next seminar series uh, on 15th December uh, about the role of government in scientific research in Africa. Uh, the speaker will be Prof. Alina Kilo. Uh, she's the Dean and Faculty of, uh, of, Faculty of Human Sciences at Namibia University of Science and Technology. Uh, it will be an important session. We covered previously private uh, sector and non-governmental organizations. Uh, and also we have uh, several uh, topics to be covered in next years. Uh, also, we have um, ASFI course coming this month from 13th to 17th December. Uh, it is about the art of scientific writing and publishing. Um, the uh, teacher and the moderator of the course will be uh, Prof. Bright Nwaru. Uh, registration will be open uh, this week and we will uh, provide information and send to all the registered uh, participants. Uh, don't um, forget to um, <laughs> don't forget uh, to apply for this course and send your uh, CV. Uh, because it is very important for those who are starting or even those who are senior in their uh, career um, in science and research. Um, thank you all for attending. Uh, looking forward to your future participation. If you have any questions or, or if you, have, uh, you want to participate in ASPI um, programs, volunteer as a mentor or uh, participate as a mentee, uh, please contact us. This is the contact emails for um, me and uh, Prof. Nawaru. Uh, we thank you all and have a good evening. Bright. Yes, thank you Bright. very much. Thank you very much, Eman, um, for um, leading this session. And Prof. Babalola, we appreciate your very fantastic uh, presentation. Um, like you said, um, uh, two hours is not enough to cover this very big, big topic. Uh, but we are happy that um, you have touched on the key issues and done justice to um, your presentation. So we are really grateful for that. And uh, again, Amanda, to support Eman's appreciation, thank you very much um, for a fantastic moderation. Um, 
We are looking forward to having you more and Prof. Babalola in uh, our session next year. Um, okay, thank you everyone for coming. Um, we are happy to have you here and please don't fail to join the next session. We have two more sessions to go this year and then we will go into the um, um, seminar series for next year. Um, that will be on a different trajectory, but very interesting trajectory where we'll be showcasing the uh, cutting edge research done by Africans for Africa that is contributing to development in Africa. So have a good night, everyone, and a great week ahead. Good night. Thank you all. Thank you for having me. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.